Hey everybody, my name is Andrew Baird. I'm a Principal Solutions Architect with AWS and welcome to DevOps 303, where we're gonna talk about how to choose the right modern deployment strategy. It's a topic I'm really passionate about. We're gonna cover all sorts of different deployment mechanics and options you have on AWS, regardless of the, the compute service that your application has been deployed to. Um, so let's jump in, we've got 30 minutes. So I'm gonna go through the uh, a general refresher first. That's so gonna give you some kind of baseline terminology so that we're on the same page about CI and CD. Uh, then I'm gonna describe some overall tenets, some goals, you know, some foundational things that your deployment should be aware of when you're defining what your deployment strategy is. And then I'm gonna talk through uh, what I'm calling considerations. These are kind of within any deployment strategy. These are some kind of core options that you have to choose between and your preference in those considerations may help you choose which option is right for you. And then I'm gonna go through the, the specific actual deployment options available for you. Um, these modern deployment options that are available on the AWS platform and some details about how to implement each of them um, on top of AWS. Uh, before wrapping it up all together and kind of you know reminding you the things we talked about already, um, hopefully you're thinking about your own application throughout those, uh, those initial slides, and then when we wrap it all together, you'll know which one might be the best fit for you. Uh, so let's jump in. So first, again, we're going to refresh some general terminology about CI/CD. Uh, we've broken the uh, software development lifecycle into these four phases: source, build, test, and production. And there's some specific activities that are typically happening at each one of those phases. Source is, you know, the active development that's happening, and when the code gets checked into a repository, some human processes that are generating the code, reviewing the code. Um, but nothing's running yet. It's just the, you know, the code related uh, mechanisms that you have. And then the build process is taking that code and actually compiling it, making sure that the style meets your standards, that the, you know, code coverage from a test perspective is, is there and meeting whatever policies you set forth. Uh, and that the code that's been written is able to be uh, compiled into some type of deployable unit. You've got um, an artifact or a set of artifacts that have been uh, compiled together and able to be deployed now. Um, and then a test phase where you take that deployable artifact and you integrate it into a running environment. There's other maybe services that are going to uh, integrate with this deployable unit you've just deployed. Uh, make sure that those integrations between them are, are working, that um, any dependencies you have uh, or things that depend on you are happy with the changes that have been made to this new deployable artifact. Uh, and just go through a slew of different testing to give uh, your team and your business confidence that when it gets deployed to your customers or into the production environment, that things are gonna be successful and they're gonna be secure. And then finally, once you've been satisfied that all the testing is given the confidence you require, um, you're gonna take that deployable unit and put it into a production environment, whatever that means for you. And it's gonna be you know, getting access by your customers. It's gonna be uh, something your business is running on top of. Uh, and then continually, you're gonna be you know, monitoring the success of that code that you've written um, through various metrics and monitoring available. And each one of these phases is all about creating those feedback loops. Every one of these um, different phases of the SDLC and the, the activities that happen within them are about creating feedback loops so that you're able to catch problems early, to um, identify fixes early. You can uh, gather insights about the way the application is behaving or the way your users are interacting with it. Um, so uh, building in feedback loops throughout. Um, and AWS has got a slew of offerings, a slew of services that uh, provide capabilities for each one of those individual moments of the SDLC, all the way from uh, code repositories with our code commit service and the IDE to, to help you develop code that's going to be contributed there on our Cloud9 service, um, all the way through the actual mechanisms of deployment and subsequent monitoring inside of uh, your production environment and all your other environments there within. So a slew of services available here. I'm not going to go through all of them today, obviously, um, but just know that for each one of those moments in the SDLC, you've got uh, service native capabilities on AWS to you know, bring uh, additional automation, uh, enhancements, um, better visibility, transparency um, uh, throughout uh, your application's lifecycle. Uh, but really today, since we're talking deployment, um, the service we're mostly going to focus on the context of is AWS Code Deploy. Um, so Code Deploy is the service that helps take those deployable artifacts or those changes that need to occur in a running environment and helps instrument uh, those changes taking place. Um, so it's available uh, at any scale. This, this is, you know, whether your application is running on a single server um, or as a single container or it, you know, is comprised of tens of thousands of servers. It's a fully scalable service um, and it's able to support applications that have been deployed on, you know, these various compute types that exist, these paradigms where your application could be running 
on servers, it could be running on containers, it could be running serverlessly as part of AWS Lambda, and Code Deploy provides um, these programmatic mechanisms to make deployments be safe and automated, regardless of what the uh, compute paradigm is that your application is running within, and uh, a slew of different hooks to you know, allow you to decide what types of tests should occur, when testing, sh uh, what the behavior should be when those tests succeed or fail, uh, the monitors that the deployment process should be aware of to know when rollbacks should occur, just a slew of different features um, related to each of those things that happen within the, the act of deployment of an application. So that's code deploy. Um, and we'll talk about, uh, once we get to the, the different options, how code deploy relates to those different options that are available. But, but first, I'm going to take a step back again and talk about kind of the general tenets that, are, uh, that you should be thinking about when you're pursuing a modern deployment strategy. It's not just about automating deployment for the sake of automation in itself. There's things you should be striving for from a, um, you know, a business perspective or a, a, a team perspective um, to, to make sure that those deployments are successful and, and safe. So these are the tenets I want to highlight that I think are true for every modern deployment that exists today. Um, maybe you've got you know, a way that these are going to be unique to your specific application, but we think these are, these are pretty universal. Um, it should always be a goal within uh, modern deployment that uh, there's not going to be any disruption to the business, clearly. The, the, the money shower is turned on, you're generating revenue, and this guy's very happy smile would look a lot less so if your deployment causes orders to stop on your website or for your, your uh, website visitors to no longer be able to utilize a feature that's important to the money shower. Um, so uh, making sure there's no disruption is, is clearly priority number one. Uh, any type of modern deployment that requires downtime or business disruption is clearly not going to um, be as good as it could be. Uh, next, making sure they're iterative and frequent. Uh, the, the more you're able to reduce the risk of a deployment by making changes smaller, um, you're able to you know, ensure that the types of um, you know, possible bugs that could exist are able to be, you know, you're able to have a really narrow scope of investigation for the types of changes that occurred. Um, and by doing so, and by making them iterative, you're able to make them more frequent because um, they're able to be done in smaller batches, you know, quicker development cycles that result in deployment to production. It means you can deliver features for your business partners faster, for your product managers faster, and all of those things. So striving to be iterative and frequent in your deployment is important. Um, and one of the things that enables that is having really hardened versions. So um, whether you're thinking about specific you know, image versions of Docker containers, um, or you know, named versions of a of a you know a, a, a commit against a, a code repository. Um, the ability to kind of treat those things not just as versions on their own, but as a holistic version of your application, so that um, should you need to do a rollback in the future or go back to some other prior state, um, or be able to assert um, what the, what the future state is going to be, so that you know dependencies that you have or that depend on you are speaking in the same terms of what those versions mean. You talk about a holistic version of, of an application deployment so that um, all of those dependencies therein um, are following the same type of version um, process. Um, so that if I'm on version 2 today and I need to, to roll back to version 1.9, 1.9 uh, brings with it not just the version of my code that's running, but any other dependencies it might have had within the operating system, um, other services I'm depending on perhaps even. Um, but you're able to talk about these hardened versions that, um, that you know, give you confidence about state. Uh, and, and the state of a deployment. Um, clearly, I don't need to say much more about automation and that how these deployments should be automated. No operations team or development team um, clearly wants to have to care and feed for a deployment while it's occurring. Um, so making sure they're automated is super important. And then uh, auditability, something that often gets a little forgotten and, and is not just important during um, you know, audit in the, the security sense so that you can see who'd made changes and when they occurred, but in the operational sense too. Um, so that when you need to find the, 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 the smoking gun, so to speak, of when a bug occurred um, and what's causing it within an environment, um, a good solid audit trail that's you know, being preserved and is available uh, in all of your log analysis tools and your, your operational uh, logging tools um, gives you that ability to dive in really fast and understand where um, you know, errors might have begun within an environment, which deployment they might be associated with. And thus, what code changes you know, underneath the covers or configuration changes may have been related to um, that audit trail and that, that trail of breadcrumbs you're, you're looking at. So these are the deployment tenants we're talking about. Again, they kind of all feed into each other, but the goal is to have a really nice and clean, safe, automated deployment so that you can iterate fast, you can iterate with business confidence, and that you're not requiring a lot of you know, manual man hours in order to achieve that. 
um, with, with the pace of innovation and how often deployments are happening uh, in a modern application. Um, so now I'm going to talk about considerations. So these are, like I said, regardless of which option you choose, there's some kind of uh, core decisions you'll be making about how you treat your infrastructure during a deployment and how that uh, might inform which deployment options are best fit for you. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is metrics, tests, and alarms. So this is bare bones no matter which option you choose. This, is, this should be kind of seen as a prerequisite to having a good modern deployment approach. Um, just simply implementing automated, uh, automated deployments on their own without having all three of these things, um, you know, a, a mature approach to these three things already baked into your application is going to lead potentially to some pretty bad failures from a deployment perspective. Uh, you can only trust your deployments as, as, as much as your metrics give you visibility into what the real health of your application is. Uh, you're only going to have confidence that the deployment is going to be successful if your test suites um, are, are covering enough in terms of functionality. Uh, to know that you're, you're checking the right things um, before your customers are, are the real test cases. And that alarms exist so that when those deployment, uh, you know, potentially, those deployments potentially go wrong or bugs exist, and metrics now show, you know, fluctuations that maybe aren't, um, aren't what they should be, um, alarms are able to catch those things at the right thresholds and, you know, notify deployment mechanisms that rollback should occur um, quickly and safely before your customers are really, you know, having, having a lot of pain for a long duration. And we provide you a lot of these things out of the box and really easy ways to take advantage of them using built-in metrics for a lot of our services. Almost all of our services have um, a slew of built-in metrics that are relevant for operations. Um, but the, the idea is to not only depend on those. It's important to use those, but you know your business context and your application context best. And there's going to be metrics that you have to gather related to your own applications that we're not going to give you out of the box. So things like how many orders are completing as part of your e-commerce website. How many users are, are visiting a specific page within your application? Um, how many errors are being generated by a specific line of code within your application? That is important, maybe um, related to revenue being generated. Um, those are the types of things that live inside your application that you should be generating metrics on and creating your own tests around and your own alarms around. So regardless of what deployment methodology you, you end up choosing, these are bare bones requirements that all of them will, will really require. Um, uh, a newer feature, it's, it's, it's been uh, released as part of CloudWatch that I want to point people to that might not be taking advantage of it already um, that just released this year is uh, CloudWatch Composite Alarms. So this is the ability to take uh, single CloudWatch metrics and alarms and aggregate them into these logical conditional statements like I have highlighted on the right of the slide here um, and combine them into single alarms. And, and really for um, any type of rollback, um, uh, any alarm that's going to inform a rollback decision or, or give you a sense of the overall health of your application, it really should be one of these aggregate alarms, right? That's, that's the, the kind of model we follow here at AWS too, um, where you have a slew of different metrics that talk about the overall health, uh, talk about specific health parameters within your application, like, you know, latency or the number of errors that are occurring or how many requests you're receiving or uh, CPU utilization, a slew of different things. And if any one of those metrics is out of balance, it could cause uh, you know, a need for an alarm to fire. And taking advantage of composite alarms lets you create those really nice coarse-grained uh, you know, uh, alarm statements that you know, there's something going wrong. It could be any one of these individual things. But rather than have to you know, have a bunch of fine-grained alarms that exist way down at the individual metric level, you can aggregate them together into this full picture of health within your application and, uh, and take advantage of co composite alarms. So if you're not familiar with composite alarms, uh, we're going to talk deployment a lot more, don't worry. But hopefully this is a nice little um, treat, an extra bonus piece of knowledge you can take with you. So take a look at composite alarms in CloudWatch. Uh, the, next, the next consideration that's going to help inform what decisions you make for deployment is whether you want to pursue mutable versus immutable infrastructure. Um, there's been a big push uh, among a lot of our customers for mutable infrastructure because there's a lot of benefits for it. But there might be good reasons why Immutable infrastructure doesn't make sense for your application. There's some pros and cons for both. Um, so what this really refers to, immutable infrastructure means that after a, a, uh, a deployment has occurred, a piece of infrastructure has been created and is active within the environment, nothing can change it again. Um, that means you know, no human access to the operating system, uh, no deployment of configuration changes to uh, you know, a live server, uh, no deployment artifacts can change at all. Once that piece of infrastructure is out and open in the environment and, and serving its purpose in the, in the architecture, it can't change anymore. Nothing can access it and, and nothing can change it. Um, whereas mutable is obviously the, the inverse of that, where um, a running server, you still have the ability, if you need to change something in place, um, access that server for some reason, uh, you'll be able to do that. 
Um, so I've got some pros and cons highlighted here. Um, on the mutable infrastructure side, uh, we find that you know if, if you're the type of environment where your operational processes, for whatever reason, really favor the the um, you know have a culture of favoring hot fixes of you know having folks jump into the an active server or deploying configuration changes to the active environment quickly, um, for whatever reason, you know that's a it's a pretty dangerous um, thing from a security perspective. But there might be a reason why you have to do it. Um, encouraging mutable infrastructure is, is kind of a requirement. You want to be able to you know, quickly jump on a server and make a change. Um, whereas the alternative to that on the operational side is there might be a lot of complexity because you're allowing changes to occur outside the normal boundaries of automation um, or outside the, you know, the coarse-grained activities of provisioning infrastructure or um, you know, new pieces of infrastructure that are, um, you know, can, trust, can be trusted to be hardened, uh, so to speak. Um, so it could make the investigations, you know, more complex. Um, whereas on the immutable side, uh, you can have a lot of confidence that this piece of infrastructure hasn't changed and the behavior that you're seeing is associated with, you know, that, that you know, all of those things that are baked into it already and there hasn't been any additional changes that have occurred to it since, um, which is, you know, able to, you know, simplify a lot of times you identifying when the problem or root cause may have started occurring within your environment. Um, a couple other change, uh, uh, things I'd like to highlight is the, um, the cost difference, um, if you deploy very frequently or you have a reason to have a very large amount of infrastructure running alongside um, each other during a deployment, running immutable infrastructure could be cost prohibitive um, or run into scaling concerns that you might have. Whereas uh, immutable infrastructure, uh, because you're able to make those changes in place, uh, may be more cost effective for the way your application deployments occur. Um, but it also means you might be able to roll back really quickly too, because you don't need to reprovision infrastructure anymore and wait for server to come up potentially if you're if you're dependent on servers. Um, okay, so let's move forward and talk about what the the actual options of modern deployment might be. So the first one I'm going to highlight is called rolling deployment or linear deployment. So this is I've got a running application and I'm going to incrementally increase uh, the percentage of of the environment that's running the new application uh, in comparison to the old application. So a lot of reasons folks like this is it adds risk incrementally. Um, we're going to be uh, deploying to you know, small units of infrastructure one by one. Uh, it limits how many changes are happening concurrently. If something goes wrong, I can detect it pretty quickly and roll back um, without the entire environment having been changed. And it lets me reuse the infrastructure that's already there in the environment. Um, some cons of this is sometimes uh, if you have a, a very large number of servers or, or uh, application components and you're a very risk-averse organization, it might take a really long time for a linear deployment to, com to, to complete. You know, if you want to deploy one server at a time over you know, 100 servers and it's going to take several minutes for that deployment to occur, those things can add up pretty, pretty quickly and it could be a really long time before the deployment is considered successful. Uh, on the same, you know, the same tone, the, the rollback can take just a, as long a period of time. It can obviously change your your strategy of how quickly you might want to roll back, um, rolling back at a higher percentage rate than you did on the way forward. But um, there might be reasons why you can't. Maybe you're you know, tightly managing how connections to dependencies work and you need to make sure that you know, it's, a, it's a nice gradual rolling change rather than opening a floodgate on one side or the other. Um, so in those rollback cases, it might uh, lead to really long rollback times. And this idea of a heterogeneous environment can be a, a complex thing to manage and deal with as well. In the midst of a deployment, you have a single environment that is running multiple versions of your application. Uh, they could be interacting with, uh, you know, a single set of dependencies and creating um, a, an operational investigation scenario where odd things are maybe happening with how state is being stored, um, how object definitions are changing, and your, you know, your, your various dependencies need to be aware that I've got multiple uh, versions of my application running at the same time and how traffic gets routed to each version that's running. Just an extra layer of complexity, this idea that you've got multiple versions running within, within one environment, okay? Um, so if, if, if this is the right you know, type of approach for you, there's a couple different ways you're gonna implement it. So for the EC2 service, um, if you're using code deploy as your deployment mechanism, um, there, I've got CloudFormation snippets here and, and YAML kind of highlighting where the various properties associated with, this, with the configuration of code deploy relates to choosing a linear or rolling deployment. Um, so this idea of minimum healthy hosts um, it's, it's basically informing code deploy that I always want to make sure that 90% of my hosts are healthy. And if they're in the middle of a deployment, we kind of consider them unhealthy, right? Because they're not able to actively serve requests because the deployment's in the midst of happening. So you're able to define what is the minimum percent that are, that are still stable and healthy and serving traffic on the old version or the new version. And, and what percent, therefore, 
is able to be taken down to have a deployment occur against that, that piece of infrastructure. Um, so that percentage between, between uh, you know, one and one in a hundred will define uh, how many, or, or zero and a hundred will define uh, how many hosts are able to be taken offline and how quickly that rolling deployment occurs. Um, the second box I have below is, is related to load balanced applications where code deploy will help um, take control of, of registering and deregistering instances from their, their, uh, their network load balancer, application load balancer, um, so that traffic is routed appropriately as versions change. And then on the, on the right, slide, uh, right side of the slide, uh, you can actually use auto-scaling as a deployment mechanism as well. You don't need code deploy for this um, type of, of deployment mechanic, where as you um, use auto-scaling, you can design, design another launch configuration where you've got a new server image that's going to be introduced into the auto-scaling group. And auto-scaling itself will roll that new uh, launch configuration image into the group at the rate with which you're, uh, you're defining here for what the batch size of that rolling update should be um, and uh, what t type of cooldown and pause times exist um, between updates um, that are occurring within the group. So you can use auto-scaling even to achieve um, the, the rolling deployment type within EC2. Um, if you're using um, our ECS service for container-based applications, um, you have a property called deployment configuration where similar to the, you know, the code deploy option within uh, EC2, uh, this one will be about you know, the, the maximum and minimum percentage of healthy containers that are running as part of your service, um, where you can uh, inform code deploy. In this case, I want to make sure that my uh, desired number of tax tasks is always running at 100% and never less than it so I can satisfy the traffic demand I expect. But I'm willing to go over that amount by 10%, up to 110%, so that ECS will be introducing another 10% of, of, uh, of the new version of that, of that image of my container into the service um, in a rolling way. Uh, and then if you're running serverlessly and want a rolling or linear deployment, there is a, a property as well available for your Lambda function um, called deployment preference. Uh, where you define the type, and there's a, a specific named types uh, of, of, of deployment preference available to you by the Lambda service. And one of them is a linear option where you define um, the percent of which you'd like that linear deployment to occur um, uh, over what period of time. So I want an additional 10% of traffic shifted to the new version of my Lambda function, the new alias. Um, if you're familiar with um, uh, uh, serverless deployments using Lambda, it's all based on alias, how traffic gets shifted. Uh, there'll be a 10% shift to your new alias every three minutes. So every three minutes from 10, three minutes to 20, three minutes to 30, so on and so forth until you reach 100%. Um, so you've got the option in all three of those servers, containers, and serverless to, to achieve the rolling deployment style. Next is the, the blue-green deployment. So blue-green is about provisioning a net new infrastructure set uh, that's running the new version of your application that's going to exist alongside the application version that's, uh, the, the infrastructure that's running your old version of your application. So I have here a, a blue version starting on the left side. Uh, I, I'm going to provision a green version, and where the blue version is receiving traffic, that arrow coming from above is representing requests uh, incoming to my application. There's going to be a period of time where both of them are running simultaneously, and I'm able to uh, cordon off a small percentage of traffic, or maybe it's just test traffic and it's not even live traffic, but I'm able to send requests to that green stack, and the green stack is receiving uh, receiving those requests, and able to uh, you know we're able to get more confidence that this newly provisioned green environment is behaving healthily, um, and and we're confident that now the blue traffic can be shifted to green, uh, and we've made that shift uh, one set of images over, and you see only traffic being sent to the green stack now, and the blue stack remains available for some period of time such that if we decide a rollback needs to occur, all I need to do is shift request traffic, usually through DNS or some mechanism like it uh, in service discovery if you're, if you're running a microservices environment, where you're going to shift traffic back to that blue stack that's still up and running, and it's going to give you a really quick rollback experience. Uh, but if everything went smoothly, eventually we'll be, we'll be confident we can get rid of the blue stack and spin it down, and we're just left with the new green version of our application. So some pros here. Um, by, by taking this kind of whole infrastructure approach, I'm able to keep my um, environment consistent as it travels through my various lifecycle environments. I, I always produce a new full set of infrastructure, and I can be you know, very confident that that entire set of infrastructure is going to be you know, self-sufficient to satisfy the application, and any tests that I run against it are going to be the same. It's going to be against the same environment um, that my customers are having their requests routed to eventually. There's no, there's no in-place changes that are occurring 
um, that, you know, maybe if there's, you know, external variables that affect the way that automation occurs, um, I don't have to worry about that in a blue-green deployment because it's always a fresh set of infrastructure. And that deployment uh, mechanism can be really fast. Downsides is because you're, you're going to operate these multiple environments for some period of time, you're going to potentially incur more costs depending on how long they stay up and running and how large the application environment is and how much it costs. Uh, the other downside is hot fix can be a, uh, applying hot fixes can be a really um, difficult task and, and potentially slow. Um, because if you wanted to go from blue to green, but not necessarily roll back to blue, but in, in, instrument a very quick hot fix new deployment change to the environment, you can't just deploy that quickly into the green environment if you're running immutable infrastructure. It means you're going to have to bring up uh, yet another you know, increment of your blue environment, or call it another color, that's going to represent that to be deployed new version. Uh, of the infrastructure and, and provisioning infrastructure can often take a lot more time than just making a quick code change. Um, and then last but not least, the, you're going to have to think about what cold infrastructure means when it receives requests. If you're dependent upon things like in-memory caching or session state within your application um, and the green version that hasn't received any requests yet doesn't have those things populated, that might impact performance for some period of time while those things get populated as requests roll in. Okay, so if blue-green deployment is the right method for you, how do you implement it? Very similar type of properties being highlighted here. So in the ECS front, um, you've got the option of, of uh, having a, a built-in uh, blue-green uh, deployment capability um, where you're going to define a new set of container images for your task. And when that deployment occurs, uh, ECS will provision the new um, uh, blue-green environment, but linearly shift traffic to the green set of images. Um, so even though it's, it's, a, it's a call out of a linear configuration here, it's really going to provision that new set of images because there's no in-place deployment with the container image, right? It's always going to be, so to speak, a green, uh, fresh container image that's been deployed. So I put it in this blue-green category, but you're able to kind of linearly shift traffic over to that green image um, over time. And then on Lambda, uh, the same type of idea as before with ECS, you're not making code changes within... Uh, a Lambda function itself, too. It's always a new Lambda function uh, alias that's serving traffic. So that same idea of it being uh, really a linear shift of traffic, but to a green environment is, is also how you'd implement it in Lambda. Um, with EC2, it's, it's going to be um, required to implement that fully fresh environment um, to, to have a new set of EC2 instances, servers, that get deployed as part of your application. And you're going to instrument the blue-green deployment mechanic through something like DNS shift of traffic um, or, you know, another service discovery mechanism that's going to allow traffic to be served by those new server images. Because on code deploy, um, when you're implementing deployments with servers, you're going to be making changes within those server images themselves. You could still use code deploy to help you deploy your code to that new green environment, but if you want the blue-green experience, you're going to have to do the traffic shifting um, through DNS or another, another mechanism. Uh, last option I'm going to highlight is Canary or one-box deployments. Um, so this is the ability to uh, change the smallest unit of infrastructure possible within your environment. Be confident that uh, that one unit of infrastructure is behaving healthy. And then uh, flip the entire rest of the application to uh, the new set of, uh, to, to the new version of your application. So you're able to really minimize risk, focus on that tiny portion of your environment. Uh, and it allows you to experiment too. You could use that tiny environment where there's a tiny piece of infrastructure running to experiment on new features, A-B testing, um, or, or just reduce deployment risk like here. Um, some cons of this, or uh, some cons of the, the Canary approach, um, if you're going to create a, a one box or a Canary environment that represents your application, you're going to have to you know, have a new environment you're supporting that may be, that may be um, serving production traffic as part of your application. So a rollback is now going to be multi-staged, just like a deployment is going to be multi-staged. You've got a, a brand new type of production environment um, that lives on its own that you're deploying to independently. Um, so you need to be aware of that additional staging that's going to come into, come into play um, as you're kind of going through your deployment steps. And, and that might bring additional complexity to that idea that these two, these two environments that are always going to be serving production traffic um, are going to need to be kept in sync. Um, you know, are there tooling that's aware that there's now an independent environment? You've got to be aware of that. Um, so... How you implement Canary or one-box deployment on um, EC2 is uh, similar as before. You're going to need to create a new environment, um, which is required for EC2. But you always have the ability to create that new environment with ECS and Lambda as well. To Rather than just have a production environment, create another named, um, named environment for your containers or Lambda function. And then I've got properties called out here 
um, to do the canary type of deployment where 10% of my container image uh, of the new version is going to retrieve uh, receive traffic before the other 90% of the traffic is shifted to the, the new application version. And similarly on Lambda, shift 10% for a course of 10 minutes over to my new alias, but after that 10 minutes is up, the other 90% is going to immediately shift over to the, to the new version of my, my application alias. Okay. So I've walked through the different options available to you and kind of some details of how to implement them. So how do you choose between them? Remember, step one, make sure your metrics, tests, and alarms are in place. Um, the second step is to remember embracing automation. The co core of all of these options is that it should be automated. Um, and the third is whichever option you choose, start small and think of it, think of your deployment process as another piece of software. It's another type of application you're supporting almost, the deployment mechanics for you. And be iterative. You know, you don't have to solve all of your deployment requirements um, right from the beginning. Um, and and you know, think about ways in which your deployment can mature over time in an iterative way, just like you build application uh, changes into into the actual application that's being deployed to. Um, and then finally, think about which downsides I've kind of described might be most impactful um, to the way that you operate or your culture, and that might help you choose which type of of application uh, deployment methodology would avoid those downsides the best um, that, that would impact you. Uh, and if a little teaser here, if you want to get a sense of how AWS does deployments ourselves and why we have a pretty modern approach, I would say, to, to deployment, and we, we embrace a bit of all of those methodologies I've described from team to team, there's a really great blog post available in our builders library that describes exactly how our, our uh, safe hands-off deployments are automated on top of AWS, and this is a little image to define for you how deployment really does occur on top of AWS within our own environment. And if you want to learn more in detail, there's actually another session available to you called uh, in the Builder Library session um, uh, 207, where Claire is going to dive really deeply into all of the things that the blog post talks about. And if you want to learn more about how AWS deploys, I really recommend you check out, you check out her session as well. And again, I thank you very much for joining DevOps 303. Um, hopefully you've learned a little bit about the deployment options available to you. My name is Andrew Baird again, um, and hope you're enjoying reInvent. Have a have a great uh, conference. Thanks.